Hi everyone, this lesson is on vaginal candidiasis. So vaginal candidiasis is also known as vulvovaginal candidiasis or a yeast infection. So it is a vaginal infection with candida species. Now candida are a fungus. So there are multiple species of candida. One of them is known as candida albicans, and this is actually the most common cause of a yeast infection. It accounts for approximately 90% of cases. And then other organisms that can cause a yeast infection include Candida glabrata and Candida tropicalis. And ultimately, these fungal species can cause what we call vulvovaginitis. So what this means is that the vulva and the vagina are inflamed. And in the case where Candida species causes vulvovaginitis, we call this Candida vulvovaginitis. So as you can see, this condition can be described by many different names, but we're going to mostly use the term vulvovaginal candidiasis as this describes that both the vulva and the vagina can be affected by this condition. So here's an image of candida. Now candida can be a part of the normal flora on people's skin. So it can be part of the normal microbial population found on people's skin and not cause infection in those individuals. But some individuals, it can cause an infection. And for different reasons, so certain disruptions in the immune system or in other epithelial barriers or in the environment of the vagina, the candida species can enter and penetrate superficially into the vaginal mucosa. We'll talk about this in more detail as to why this can occur when we talk about the risk factors later on in this lesson. But nonetheless, when the candida species penetrate into the vaginal mucosa or the epithelial lining of the vagina, it can lead to inflammation. And then what can happen is once they have infiltrated into the epithelium, the patient's immune cells will come in and will deal with that infection. Now, these immune cells are going to include monocytes and polymorphonuclear leukocytes. So they will migrate in and mediate inflammation. So they are going to come in and take care of the infection, but at the same time, they're going to cause inflammation, other signs and symptoms, which we'll talk about later on in this lesson. Now, there are different types of vulvovaginal candidiasis. One includes acute vulvovaginal candidiasis. Another is chronic vulvovaginal candidiasis. And the third is recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. So we're going to talk about these in more detail later on when we talk about the signs and symptoms. Now, vulvovaginal candidiasis is a very common condition. And as mentioned before, candida can be a cause of vulvovaginitis. Again, that's an inflammation of the vulva and the vagina. And candida infections account for approximately one-third of cases of vulvovaginitis. And this condition is so common, in fact, that it is estimated that up to 70% of females will have vulvovaginal candidiasis at some point in their life. And 5 to 8% will suffer from recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why they may suffer from this more often than other individuals. Let's talk about the risk factors now. So some of the risk factors for getting vulvovaginal candidiasis includes states of increased endogenous estrogen production. So these states can include pregnancy. So pregnancy is a high estrogen state, but not only that, it can change the environment within the vaginal cavity and also increase glycogen within the vaginal cavity as well, which can then lead to increased likelihood that microbes like candida can go in and use that glycogen for energy. So pregnancy can be a state where patients can often be at a higher risk for having vulvovaginal candidiasis. In obesity, with having more adipose tissue, there's going to be more production of estrogen, and this can also increase the likelihood of having this condition as well. Using exogenous estrogen, so exogenous estrogen is going to be taken from outside of your body. So if you're on hormone replacement therapy, you're more likely to have vulvovaginal candidiasis. Or if you're taking an older type of contraceptive pill, so older contraceptives had higher levels of estrogen and they increased the likelihood of having vulvovaginal candidiasis, but the newer contraceptives have lower levels of estrogen, so they're less likely to cause this. Having type 2 diabetes is a risk factor for this condition, so it's due to immunocompromise. And then immunosuppression in general, so any condition that's going to cause immunosuppression or any medication the patient's using that may suppress their immune system is going to increase the risk of this condition. So having HIV or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is going to increase the likelihood of having this as well. Recent broad spectrum antibiotic use. So using an antibiotic with a broad spectrum or that has a wide range of targets can ultimately destroy or kill off some of the beneficial bacteria within the vaginal cavity, which can then lead to increased likelihood that other microbes like candida can come in and try to take over. 
Wearing tight-fitting undergarments is another risk factor. So wearing tight-fitting undergarments can produce an environment that is beneficial for the growth of candida. Having certain hygiene issues, so douching or wiping after using the washroom the wrong way, both of these can increase the likelihood of having this as well. And then having a genetic predisposition for having vulvovaginal candidiasis. So some patients are going to have a genetic predisposition for getting vulvovaginal candidiasis, and it's these patients that are more likely to have issues with recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. So several genes have been implicated a gene that encodes for mannose binding lectin and patients who also have higher levels of interleukin-4 are also at a higher risk for getting this as well. So interleukin-4 seems to play a role in suppressing anti-candida responses. So if you're suppressing that response, you're not going to get an anti-candida response meaning that having high interleukin-4 or IL-4 can increase your likelihood of having this condition as well. And then there's also an association with increased prevalence in sexually active patients. Now, vulvovaginal candidiasis is not considered a sexually transmitted infection, but there is an association with having higher sexual activity and having this as well. And it may be due to disruptions or changes in the microbial environment. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of acute vulvovaginal candidiasis. So this is where a patient's going to first start to have an infection. So often the characteristic and primary symptoms are going to include vulvar itching and vulvar burning. So these again are going to be the primary symptoms. We can also see issues with vaginal discharge and the vaginal discharge in acute vulvovaginal candidiasis is going to be white and thick. So it's going to differ from other types of vaginal conditions. And it's often described as cottage cheese-like or curd-like. So it can be this white, thick, adherent discharge. We can also see something called thrush patches. And we can also see issues with labial erythema and edema. So the labia, like the labia majora and menorah, are going to be erythematous, so they'll be more reddened and more edematous, meaning that they're swollen. So this is due to that inflammatory response we talked about before. And patients can also describe having dysuria, which is a burning sensation when urinating. Now these symptoms actually may be more pronounced just prior to menstruation, and patients can often describe having worsened or exacerbated symptoms after urination or intercourse as well. And most of these symptoms we're going to see with a candida albicans infection. If patient has a candida glabrata infection, for instance, the symptoms may be less severe, they may be more mild. Now let's talk about chronic vulvovaginal candidiasis. So chronic vulvovaginal candidiasis is essentially going to be a worsened state of what we just talked about in the last slide. So we're going to see increasing edema, so even worse swelling than in the acute form. We can also see issues with vulvar lichenification, so this is where the vulva becomes thickened. We can also see issues with severe vulvar itching and burning. So the itching and burning becomes more and more severe in this condition. We can also see issues with irritation and pain as well. So chronic vulvovaginal candidiasis is like the acute form, but worsened. Oftentimes, we're not going to see that discharge, and we can often see this in patients who are older and who have immunosuppression or have longstanding type 2 diabetes. Now let's talk about the diagnosis and treatment of vulvovaginal candidiasis. The diagnosis is often going to be a clinical diagnosis, looking at the history and physical examination, seeing some of those signs and symptoms we talked about before is going to be enough to make the diagnosis either the clinician making the diagnosis or the patient themselves self-diagnosing. And oftentimes this is going to be something that patients will self-diagnose. But if it's going to be diagnosed by laboratory method, a wet mount test can be performed. So a wet mount test is where some vaginal discharge is put on a slide and looked under the microscope. And sometimes what can be also used is KOH. KOH is potassium hydroxide, usually 10 to 20%. And this can be dripped onto the vaginal discharge. And what this does is that it helps to lyse or destroy some cellular debris. So white blood cells or epithelial cells essentially cleans up the slide to show only the candida. So you can better see these hyphae of the candida. Now, with regards to recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, this is going to be classified or defined as having four or more diagnoses of vulvovaginal candidiasis. Now, some clinicians may assess the vaginal pH. The vaginal pH in vulvovaginal candidiasis is not going to increase. So this is going to be different than other vaginal conditions like trichomoniasis or bacterial vaginosis, where their vaginal pH is going to be above 4.5. 
but in vulval vaginal candidiasis, it's going to often be below 4.5. So this can be a way to rule out those other conditions if there's any thought or suspicion that they may have trichomoniasis or bacterial vaginosis. Once the diagnosis has been made, how is it treated? So antifungal medications can be used. Oftentimes these can be over-the-counter. And these antifungal medications are the azoles. So they have azole as a suffix in their name. And they inhibit ergosterol synthesis. So ergosterol is part of the cell membrane of candida species. So it inhibits the synthesis of that critical part of their cell membrane. So they're not able to reproduce effectively. Now, these medications can come in oral cream or suppository formulations, and there are many different medications. Again, they all have azole in their suffix, so some of them include butoconazole, ketoconazole, itraconazole, cotrimazole, and fluconazole. And some other treatment methods that are not often used include intravaginal boric acid suppository. Please check out my lesson on bacterial vaginosis and trichomoniasis, and if you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.